September 23rd, 2017. There is no sign in the heavens, and here's why. This is likely to be a rather controversial position, but the fact is that there is no sign in the heavens at all on September 23rd, regardless of what the Chaldean astrologer class, the very same ones who tell you God is not real and evolution is, it doesn't matter what they tell you. This is an invention. There is no sign in the heavens. The reason is because a sign is observable, visible, and obvious. And what we're being told is going to happen is really just something that we're being told is going to happen. Much like the eclipse, except for certain people in certain parts, there was no way to go outside and go, whoa, what is that? And that's what you need in order for something to be a sign. I need to be able to go outside and I need to be able to look at the sky and go, whoa. Now, if you look at this image here, if I looked up in the sky and I saw that, I would say, whoa. And the fact is, in my lifetime, I've seen multiple comets. I've seen multiple eclipses. I've seen all kinds of things like this. It never meant anything. Okay? It just didn't. It was any other day like any other day except something was a little bit different in the sky. These things, however, were things that I could go outside and I could look up and go, huh, look at that. So in order for something to be a sign, you have to be able to know that it's there. Now, if I took a three by five card and I wrote the, in pencil the word stop on it and glued it to a popsicle stick and stuck it in an intersection, there would not be a stop sign in that intersection, despite the fact that I made a little tiny sign that says stop on it. That's not a stop sign. And the reason why is it's actually just trash in the middle of the intersection. Now, if I go to an intersection where there's never been a stop sign before, and all of a sudden there's a big bright red octagon that says stop on it, there is now a stop sign in that intersection. Because guess what? I pull up to that intersection and I see something that wasn't there before. It's called a sign. I can see it. I can respond to it. Now, what we're being told is going to happen on September 23rd. You and I have no ability to go out and see what they claim that you're going to be able to see, which is based here in Revelation chapter 12. And it's it, it just completely strips the whole thing of the context anyway. So it's not even what they're saying it is. But furthermore, you cannot go outside and see this. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. Now, allegedly, according to the astrologer class of Chaldeans, there is a constellation that is the Virgin and a constellation uh, which is, I, I don't even remember what the details are. It's, it's irrelevant to me because as far as I'm concerned, the only constellation that I've ever looked up in the sky and said, huh, that looks like what they say it is, is the Big Dipper. I look at that and I go, you know what? That does look like a ladle. I agree with that. As far as anything else, I don't see a woman. I don't see a lion. I don't see a hunter. I don't see a dragon. I don't see any of these things. Okay? They're just figments of some astrologer's imagination that they've utterly filled in all these. So I cannot look up in the sky. I cannot look up and, I, and see a woman clothed with the sun with the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. I'm not going to be able to walk outside on September 23rd, look up in the sky and see this. So it's not a sign. It's a completely invented, fabricated imagination of somebody with too much imagination. Furthermore, let's take a look because we need to back up a little bit to find out what this is even talking about. Because I guarantee you, if you actually back up a few verses, this is not going to happen on September 23rd. So let's go back to chapter 11 of Revelation. And we see at the end of it that it says, And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. And the reason we know that this is relevant to the next passage regarding this sign in heaven is that it says, And there appeared. So this is not just starting over with something new. This says, and there appeared. So going back, and the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament. So apparently 
what we're describing here is looking up and seeing the Ark of the Testament in heaven and having lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. So if I see all that, then maybe I will look up in the sky and see a woman clothed with the sun and the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of 12 stars. But if I don't see the rest of this stuff, then I don't see the then I don't see what's happening here. Furthermore, this is actually not even describing something in it's which is just another whole issue there that I don't really want to get into at the moment. So verse two, it says, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pains to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven and behold, a great red drag. Are we going to see this? A great red dragon having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered for to devour her child as soon as it was born. This is actually referencing the uh, slaughter of all the children by Herod when Jesus was born. That he, he tried to kill Jesus by killing every children in the king, every child uh, under two in the kingdom. So this is actually talking about something that already happened. Um, but uh, that's not to say that there isn't something future uh, to come with this, because I think that uh, eschatology in the study of end times, I think that all of the ideas are incomplete because they all exclude all the others. I think that it does talk about the past. It does talk about the present. It does talk about things that are figurative and symbolic. And it does talk about things that are future yet to come. But this is not going to happen on September 23rd of 2017. And I hope that you, if, if you have somebody who's saying that something is going to happen or could happen or might happen, they don't even have enough sense in their head to realize what a sign is and what the qualifications of a sign is. They haven't defined the word correctly. They also haven't defined the word dispensation correctly either, um, which is another entire topic of its own. Um, but let's take a look at what God says a sign is. So we go to Genesis 1 and verse 14, and it says, And God said, Let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. Let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And let them be for lights in the firmament of the heaven to give light upon the earth. And it was so. So we see where the idea is coming from, that there are things in the heaven that are for signs. So that part is correct. Now we go to Exodus 4 and we see what kind of things God uses as signs. Now, this is not in the heavens, but we look at Exodus 4 to find out just you know, how how much is this something that you have to have somebody tell you what's happening or how much could you actually observe this yourself? And so we see in Exodus chapter four, it says, and Moses answered and said, but behold, they will not believe me nor hearken unto my voice, for they will say the Lord hath not appeared unto thee. And the Lord said unto him, what is that in thine hand? And he said, a rod. And he said, cast it on the ground. And he cast it on the ground and it became a serpent. And Moses fled from before it. This must have been rather shocking to have a rod suddenly turn into a serpent. This must have been something rather observable and obvious and apparent and not something that he needed to be told happened. He witnessed it and he responded to it. And the Lord said to Moses, put forth thine hand and take it by the tail. And he put forth his hand and caught it and it became a rod in his hand. That they may believe that the Lord God of their fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob hath appeared unto thee. And the Lord said furthermore unto him, Put now thine hand in thy bosom. And he put his hand into his bosom. And when he took it out, behold, his hand was as leprous as snow. And he said, Put thine hand into thy bosom again. And he put his hand into his bosom again and plucked it out of his bosom. And behold, it was turned again as his other flesh. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe thee, neither hearken to the voice of the first sign, they will believe the voice of the latter sign. And it shall come to pass, if they will not believe also these two signs, Neither hearken unto thy voice that thou shalt take of the water of the river and pour it upon the dry land, and the water which thou takest out of the river shall become blood upon the dry land. Again, these are things that somebody's going to be able to look at and go, Whoa, look at that. How did that happen? And so 
we get to verse 10, it says, And Moses said unto the Lord, O my Lord, I am not eloquent, neither heretofore, for since thou hast spoken unto thy servant, but I am slow of speech and of a slow tongue. And the Lord said unto him, Who hath made man's mouth? Or who maketh the dem, or dumb or deaf or the seeing or the blind? Have not I the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be thy mouth, and teach thee what thou shalt say. And he said, O my Lord, send, I pray thee, by the hand of him whom thou wilt send. And the anger of the Lord was kindled against Moses, and he said, Is not Aaron the Levite thy brother? I know he can speak well, and also, behold, he cometh forth to meet thee. And when he seeth thee, he will be glad in his heart. And thou shalt speak unto him, and put words into his mouth, and I will be thy mouth, and with his mouth, and will teach you what ye shall do. And he shall be thy spokesman unto the people, and he shall be, even he shall be to thee instead of a mouth, and thou shalt be to him instead of God. And thou shalt take this rod into thy hand, wherewith thou shalt do signs. So, they're going to do signs in front of Moses, or in front of Pharaoh, rather. And the signs are going to be the plagues of Egypt. So the plagues of Egypt were signs. Um, those were pretty obvious. The plagues of Egypt, and if you don't believe that the plagues of Egypt are the signs, if you think that there were things a little less spectacular, we go to Deuteronomy 6 and verse 20, and it says, And when thy son asketh thee in time to come, saying, What mean the testimonies and the statutes and the judgments which the Lord our God hath commanded you? Then thou shalt say unto thy son, We were Pharaoh's bondmen in Egypt, and the Lord brought us out of Egypt with a mighty hand, and the Lord showed signs and wonders great and sore upon Egypt, upon Pharaoh, and upon all his household before our eyes. And he brought us out from thence, that he might bring us in to give us the land which he sware unto our fathers. So there we see that the plagues of Egypt were the signs that were given. Those were the signs. The plagues of Egypt. And so this is not something that was, you know, hey, guys, did you hear that there was something that happened that, you know, you have to use your imagination to pretend like it's actually real? You know, like you could pretend that what you look up at in the sky is a virgin and you can pretend that she has a crown of 12 stars and you can pretend like she's giving birth and you can pretend like there's there's the sun under her feet or, or whatever it is. I mean, this is all make-believe. This is all just pretend. This is all just somebody inventing a, a, an imagination of what it is. And, and I, it, as I said, if I could look up in the sky and go, hey, yeah, that is what that looks like, I'd agree with it. But I can't walk outside and look up in the sky and go, hey, yeah, that is what it looks like. So it's not a sign. It doesn't fit the definition. It's not something that I can observe. It's not something that I can walk out and I can see that it's happening. <clears throat> and so, then again, we go to Matthew chapter 16, and we see where it says in verse 1, The Pharisees also with the Sadducees came, and tempting desired that he would show them a sign from heaven. He answered and said unto them, When it is evening, ye say, It will be fair weather, for the sky is red. And in the morning it will be foul weather, Today, for the sky is red and lowering. O oh, ye hypocrites, ye can discern the face of the sky, but can ye not discern the sign of the times? A wicked and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign, and there shall be no sign given unto it, but the sign of the prophet Jonas. And he left them and departed. And when his disciples were come to the other side, they had forgotten to take bread. I didn't really mean to read that part. but um, So they, they departed. He's telling them, you look up at the sky and you see its color. And you determine based on whether it's day or night that if it's red and it's night, then that's cool. If it's red and it's the morning, there's a storm coming. This is this doesn't take scientists to tell you that something's happening. You walk outside, you look up, you make a determination. Red, not red. Morning, evening. Good, bad. It's real simple. A child can do it. You can teach a five-year-old and say, okay, Johnny. It's, it's evening and the sky is red. Is that good or bad? This is what he's referring to as a sign. This is not something that someone needs to, to tell you is happening in order for you to even have any concept that it's happening. Just like with the eclipse, I looked up 
you know, I and I ended up using some darkened lenses that I was able to observe that it did kind of look like a like a crescent moon version of the sun. But if I hadn't been told to look up and look through some dark lenses at that particular point in time, I wouldn't have had any concept that anything was different about that day at that time. You know, it's it wasn't a sign. It, it didn't mean anything. It didn't do anything. I've seen much more impressive things in, in the sky than that on plenty of occasions in my life. <clears throat> so it's just what's going to happen on September 23rd. It's going to be the day before September 24th is what's going to happen. And I really hope and pray that some people who are listening to some other people will stop listening to those people after, after you know, come September 24th. Because really that's, that's where we need to get with this thing is to, to not be a member of some, some coercive cult where they're trying to tell you that something's going to happen when it's not. Um, so let's just, uh, finish up here and talk about what is real. And what is real is that God came and he, he became born of a woman that he was a man, which is actually what was being described there in Revelation 12 is that Jesus was born of a virgin. And he came to live amongst us as one of us, to suffer everything that we suffer, to experience what it is to be us firsthand, to know what it's like firsthand to, to endure the things that we endure and to be tempted by the things with which we're tempted. And he came in order to suffer and die and redeem us and reconcile us back to himself with that. By his death, by his blood, our sins are purged forever. If all you do is believe. And so you see in John 6, 47, it says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that believeth on me have everlasting life. It's really that simple. Jesus knew, God knew, that we would not be able to fulfill the requirements that are required in order to be in communion with him in his presence. And so he made a covenant that was really just a promise that he was going to then come and fulfill our part of that covenant. And that's what he did. He fulfilled his part of the covenant as God, and he fulfilled our part of the covenant as the Son of Man. In verse 6, John 6, 48, he says, I am that bread of life. He says in verse 51, I am the living bread which came down from heaven. If any man eat of this bread, he shall live forever. And the bread that I will give is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. He's telling us that he gave himself for the life of everybody on this world, and that all we have to do is believe that. And then in verse 58, This is the bread which came down from heaven, not as your fathers did eat manna and are dead. He that eateth of this bread shall live forever. Amen.